there's a unification be between the two. So remember, the two were the, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the brown York uh, mass. And so I was doing this for <clears throat> three dimensions. So my setting is for now is that um, I have a Riemannian three manifold with scalar curvature greater than or equal to zero. So again, it's a special case of the uh, constraint equations. And in tomorrow's lecture, I'll talk, I'll talk about what we can say beyond that. But, um, uh, and, and so um, I, I had these three sort of general situations. I had the asymptotically flat case, which where um, the main geometric results, the positive mass theorem. Uh, and then I had the two finite cases. And the, the first case, uh, which I uh, actually called two before, is the, is the Brown-York mass. And so uh, remember what it requires is that I have some region omega. So it's, it's uh, the idea of a quasi-local mass. And the boundary of omega is a, a surface, a smooth surface. And the hypotheses for the Brown-York mass are that um, are that the, um, the Gauss curvature of the surface, that is the induced metric on the surface from the three manifold uh, is positive at each point on sigma. And the other assumption is that the mean curvature of sigma is positive. So, so that means that it's, it's uh, the mean curvature vector points inward, like a sphere in R3 has <coughs> positive mean curvature in this, in this um, <coughs> uh, convention. Uh, and under these conditions, there was a, a very beautiful uh, quasi-local mass quantity, which we called MBY. It's a function of sigma, well, really, of, of, uh, it's a function of omega, but really of the boundary geometry. And um, uh, what it is is 1 over 8 pi times the integral over sigma of H0, which is a comparison uh, mean curvature, minus H. Uh, integrated with respect to the area element on sigma. And the H0 is gotten by isometrically embedding sigma into R3. So I have my curved, my region in, in, um, in the curved space time, and I can isometrically embed the boundary by some map phi uh, into R3. And what I get is a convex body, convex surface in R3. This is phi of sigma. So that's called the vial embedding problem, which is a a very uh, fundamental uh, result in, um, in um, uh, differential geometry, which has been known since about 1950. Um, and then what I can do, the H0 is the mean curvature over here. So if I take a point P on sigma, I can look at the corresponding point over here, V of P. And then uh, H0 is the mean curvature. So H0, I think of it as a function of P. A P is actually the mean curvature uh, at phi of p. <clears throat> and so I can compare these two, uh, these two functions. And, and, uh, and the Brown-York mass is, this, uh, is uh, given by this quantity. And, and we discussed uh, <clears throat> what it looks like in, in for standard spheres in Schwarzschild and uh, some properties last time. In particular, one of the main properties is the positivity. So, so this is a theorem of Xi and Tam. It's greater than or equal to zero, and it's zero only uh, if, the, um, if the region omega actually is isometric to this region here. So, so only for a, uh, a um, region in the, in the flat R3. So that's the Brown-York the Brown mass. And the other, the other quantities which we, the, the other theorem which we described, not quite a, qu a quasi-local mass, but it's a situation where we have a region omega contained in M. And actually, there are a number of cases, but the boundary of omega in this case is assumed to be polyhedral. And we, we discussed particularly the case of the cube, where the, where the, um, where the, uh, the boundary consists of, uh, of uh, the six faces, six smooth surfaces which meet along edges. Uh, and uh, so it's the combinatorial type of a cube. Uh, uh, and also, the, we, we, we alluded to the other most important case, which is the case of a tetrahedron. So that is where you have, um, <clears throat> where you have four triangular faces uh, uh, and, and edges. So in, the, in this polyhedral case, um, there's also a theorem which, uh, which uh, relates these. And this is a theorem. So the, these, these are conjectures of Gromov. And as I indicated, Gromov 
sketched a proof in the, in the cubical case, but they were done um, rigorously in the cube and the, and the tetrahedral case uh, by Chow Li. And so, and so the theorem here is that <clears throat> um, in this case, the maximum dihedral angle, so the dihedral angles are, are um, defined at each point on the edge, the edges, the one-dimensional edges, uh, is greater than or equal to, let me call it theta naught, which is, which is the, the um, <clears throat> so in the cube case, theta naught is pi over two, and in the tetrahedral case, it's the, the dihedral angle of a regular tetrahedron. So this is the uh, dihedral angle of <clears throat> the uh, regular model. And so, and again, equality holds only in the, equality only, only if trivial, meaning that, <clears throat> meaning that the, the, the region omega is a flat region and the boundary faces are actually uh, uh, planar, uh, planar surfaces. So, um, so this, is, uh, uh, this is a kind of angle comparison theorem. Um, and and um, I, wanna, I wanna try to, try to unify these. So, so let me point out the, um, the, um, the strengths and the weaknesses of, of these. So uh, in the case of, um, in the case of uh, so let me start with strengths. Uh, in the case of the, um, the uh, brown New York mass, uh, a strength is that the, the, the result, the, uh, the quantity computed is, a, is actually a quantitative measure of the, of the uh, the uh, quasi-local mass of the region, and it's one which works quite well in, in many, many situations. So, um, so, the, so, so a, a key strength for Brown York is that the conclusion is quite satisfactory. <clears throat> Somehow sharp. Um, uh, and a, a strength of the, um, of the uh, polyhedral case uh, a key strength is that it does not require, so, so it's weaker boundary conditions. Boundary omega, right? Um, so, so in the case of, <clears throat> in the polyhedral case, I, I guess I didn't say it, but, 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 but all that's required on the, on the faces is that the mean curvature <clears throat> is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, this is <clears throat> this is greater than or equal to zero on the faces. So, in other words, <clears throat> this first assumption of, of positive Gauss curvature uh, is not there <clears throat> in the um, uh, in the polyhedral case, and that's that's a good thing because because the, the the assumption of positive Gauss curvature doesn't seem to be natural. Um, I mean, it, it certainly strongly restricts the kinds of geometries you, you can apply this to, but it's really essential even for the definition, right? So you, you, can't, you can't define this comparison region unless you know that the boundary surface is, is <clears throat> isometrically embedded into, uh, into R3. So, so you, you, you sort of can't get started without the, uh, the assumption that uh, the Gauss curvature is positive. Um, uh, and so, um, so, the, so the, the weakness, the main weakness of the brown York is, is that K sigma positive should not be necessary. One would like to remove that. Um, and the key weakness of the polyhedral situation is that it's not that quantitative. It, the, the conclusion is a little weak. Uh, so in the polyhedral case, <clears throat> Kind of a weak conclusion. For example, if we if we compare it to triangle comparison theorems, which we discussed uh, in the first lecture, uh, it would only be saying that that if we take a triangle and a surface with non-negative curvature, and um, uh, it would only be saying that the 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 largest angle of the triangle is bigger than pi over three. So for an equilateral triangle, the angles are pi over three. So the corresponding statement would, would only say that the largest angle is bigger than pi over three. And that's a weaker statement that you get either from Gauss-Bonnet, which 
gives us the statement that the sum of the angles <clears throat> is bigger than pi, bigger than or equal to pi, <clears throat> or, of course, much weaker than what you get from the Topinagov theorem, which, which actually compares individual angles for a specific comparison triangle. Okay, and so, and so, um, so the conclusion's a bit weak. And so it would be nice to, to combine these two, and there's a kind of natural way to try to do it. And so, so let me make some, I mean, <clears throat> I'm going to write down a, a, a possible statement, which I don't have much evidence for, uh, and I also don't know, don't know counterexamples, but, but um, it, it sort of comes from kind of formally combining these ideas. And so, and so, um, so how can we, we combine these two? Well, <clears throat> so one of, one of the, the, the main problems, uh, if you remove the positive Gauss curvature assumption for, for the Brown-York mass, is that you don't have a comparison. There's, there's no model. So in theorem, in, this, in the polyhedral theorem, there isn't really a model polyhedron in R3. You're, you're simply comparing <clears throat> the polyhedron to the regular polyhedron with, with, uh, uh, of, the, of the same combinatorial type, so either the cube or the, uh, or the, um, the tetrahedron. And you can do it for other polyhedral types as well. <clears throat> uh, but it, it doesn't, there's not a specific model like there is in the, in the um, Brown-York case. And so um, um, <clears throat> I would like to point out that if you, if, you look at, if you look at a polyhedral surface and you're assuming H is non-negative, um, the, the geometry is largely determined <clears throat> by the one skeleton. So in other words, if you take, um, <clears throat> let's see. If you take, uh, say, you look at a polyhedral surface, then you have the edges, which are these arcs. So this, uh, this is called the one skeleton. <clears throat> and so if you know the one skeleton, then then you sort of know the best possible choices for the faces because you could take each triangle and just fill it in with a minimal surface. So, so it's not very hard to see that if you make H smaller on the faces, you, uh, you decrease the, the dihedral angles. And so, and so somehow, somehow the, just, just like in the geodesic case, we, we, I pointed out that you, you get the same triangle comparison theorem if, if instead of taking a geodesic, you take a, a curve with geodesic curvature positive. This has k equals zero. And when you do that, <clears throat> you're sort of fattening up the triangle, so you increase the dihedral angle. Dihedral angles are bigger for the, the, the more convex one. <clears throat> and, so, <clears throat> and so you can <clears throat> sort of think of the one skeleton as being the main object that, that, um, <clears throat> that determines the, um, the geometry of the, uh, the polyhedral face. So, <clears throat> so you could ask the question, can I isometrically embed the one skeleton into R3? And actually, <clears throat> that's a, a rather easy question to answer. It's a, <clears throat> so you know, if you take a, uh, if you take curves, of course, the you can always embed them in R3 <clears throat> or R2 even uh, in many different ways. You just need a curve which has the same length. So for curves, there's no intrinsic geometry. And so uh, on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, there are there are restrictions uh, in the case of. Um, uh, in the case of uh, a collection of curves li like that, if you, if, you have, if you had a triangle, then you can always embed it <clears throat> because of the triangle inequality. But if you have four points, <clears throat> you can't necessarily embed a four-point metric space into R3. <clears throat> but on the other hand, the conditions under which you can do it are very simple conditions, which you can, you can check. It's basically linear algebra conditions. So it's not unreasonable to, to assume that the one skeleton <clears throat> is isometrically embedded in R3. So in other words, in other words, you're just assuming that there is a, a tetrahedron in R3 with the same corresponding um, side length, same corresponding uh, edge length. So, so I can assume that I have a tetrahedron. So let's label these points. So P1, P2, P3, and P4. So I could take <clears throat> P1 bar, P2 bar, P3 bar, and P4 bar, and then I could look at the edge between P1 and P2, and I could require that those have the same length, <clears throat> and then sim similarly for all the others. Okay, and so, so that's a condition which, 
Um, you can't always do it. Uh, there, there, are, <clears throat> there, are, there are cases, there are four-point metric spaces which cannot be uh, isometrically embedded in, in R3, but, <clears throat> but again, it's a much, much easier question than, uh, than whether the problem of embedding a surface into R3. That's, that's a very difficult problem in general, and <clears throat> it's really only globally known in the positive Gauss curvature case. Um, and, so, and so this is a, a question, being able to do this is, um, as I say, it's really a linear, linear algebraic um, uh, computation, and so, um, <clears throat> which is very standard. It goes back to the, about 1930, I think, uh, embedding <clears throat> finite <clears throat> metric spaces into uh, Euclidean spaces. Um, okay, and so, and so let's assume we have a <clears throat> uh, the one skeleton embedded in this way, <clears throat> then um, <clears throat> we could look at the Brown-York conclusion. So, <clears throat> sorry, we have, um, so, so the Brown-York conclusion would say that, um, <clears throat> again, that the, the integral of, um, uh, would say that the integral of H0 minus H, dA is uh, greater than or equal to zero, <clears throat> and this would be on, on sigma. O on the other hand, if, if the faces have zero mean curvature, then, then the only contribution to these integrals comes from the edges, right? And so the question is, what does this mean? So this is like what we did for, in going from the gauss bonnet theorem for a smooth curve to, a, the, to uh, <clears throat> the triangle comparison, where we just approximate the, the, we can think of approximating a triangle by rounding off the corners by a smooth curve. And when we do that, we get <clears throat> a contribution on the edges. And so, and so this inequality really restricts to a condition on the dihedral angles. And so, so in fact, the claim is if you, if you take, say, a polyhedron and you approximate it by, um, by, by a smooth um, surface and you look at the limit of the, the total mean curvature of that, um, what you get, let's say for a polyhedron, the integral, <clears throat> let's call it omega bar, the, uh, sorry, the integral over sigma naught, that would be the, the boundary of the <clears throat> tetrahedron, then this behaves like <clears throat> the integral over the edges of, um, and so it's pi minus the dihedral angle, theta naught, integrated with respect to arc length. Because if you, if you smooth, if you have, these, you have these edges, if you smooth that surface, you get <clears throat> uh, you, to the contribution to the mean curvature then is concentrated along the edges. Well, along, along the edge, nothing really happens. The things are bounded. But when you transverse to the edge, orthogonal to the edge, the angle is changing by the exterior angle. And so, and so you, can, you can argue that, <clears throat> that um, by a limiting argument or uh, that, that, that the total mean curvature is really this integral of, of the dihedral angle. So in particular, it's, uh, it's the, uh, the length of the, the edges times pi uh, minus the integral over the edges <clears throat> of theta naught, ds. Okay, and so, and similarly, I could do that. It's a local calculation, so, so I could similarly uh, uh, say that Morally, the integral of h is also <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the integral of pi minus the dihedral angles. And so this is the integral, <clears throat> this would be h naught. <clears throat> this is in, in the model space. Uh, and in the original space, it's also true. Well, well actually, there's another. So I have an, if I don't assume the faces are minimal, then, then there's an extra term. But the integral of h <clears throat> in the manifold would be the integral over the faces. <clears throat> of h, so those are smooth surfaces, uh, and then um, <clears throat> plus the integral over, so this would be e0, the edges in the model, uh, the integral over e of um, pi minus theta, integrated with respect to arc length. And again, that's, um, <clears throat> that's pi times the length of e, this should be the length of e0, minus <clears throat> the integral over e of uh, theta ds. Okay, so in particular, if I look at the difference of these two, well, these terms are the same because I'm assuming that the, that the edges are isometric. So, the, so the, the edge length, in fact, each corresponding edge length has, is the same. And so this inequality here reduces to the inequality that the integral over the edges of the tetrahedron in the manifold 
Uh, and again, I can think of theta naught uh, as a function back here because I have each point here has a corresponding point here, p of p, and I can take the dihedral angle theta naught here and just think of it as a function of p. So, so what it gives me is in the reverse order, so this is h0 minus h, so this would be theta minus theta 0, ds is greater than or equal to 0. So that would be the, um, <clears throat> so if the brown york conclusion were to hold in this, in this polyhedral setting, so I, I should say what happens to the integral of faces? Well, it comes in with the right sign, so you can, you can actually throw it away. So the, the, the optimal case, if you like, is, is when, h, when h is 0. So, so, so this, this statement really, I, I claim, is exactly analogous to the gauss bonnet statement because um, the, if, I, if I do a triangle, then then it's, it's exactly saying, so I'm integrating the, the angle over the vertices, and the vertices, uh, so, the, so, so it's, a, it's a sum of point masses, and, and the, the, the contribution on, at, the, at the mass is exactly, uh, at each edge is exactly uh, the interior angle. And so, and so, um, and so this is, um, this is uh, uh, a question. So it, it, it would be, I think a very big improvement on the on the uh, uh, the polyhedral case where um, uh, where we're working with the maximum uh, of theta, which is a a rather weak uh, a rather weak statement saying the maximum is bigger than something. It only says there's some point where where the um, <clears throat> where the dihedral angle is pretty big, right? And so this. Um, uh, this statement would be, I think, a much more precise statement. On, on the other hand, the problem is I have no idea how to prove it. And I, I thought about various cases. It's actually very non-trivial, even if this is a, uh, a, um, um, a polyhedral domain in R3. But on the other hand, I couldn't come up with counterexamples directly either. So, so there, may be, there may be more restrictions that are needed on the, on the edges. So I mean, you could, for example, require the edges to be geodesics. That's not required in the, in the theorem, but um, uh, there may, it, it may be that you need some, some further restrictions to do it. But, but at least formally, the brown york conclusion in the polyhedral case would correspond to that. I think it's a very interesting question as to whether, whether this conclusion can be, um, can be improved in the polyhedral case. It could be, uh, I mean, it could, for example, give a way of defining a quasi-local mass. So this, this quantity then is more, more stable. I mean, if you, so if I perturb the polyhedron, the maximum theta of p can jump around. You can, it can change rather, rather badly. But on the other hand, if I, if I perturb the, uh, the polyhedron, these integrals would seem to be much more, much more stable. So it's, a, it's much more likely, I think, to give, to give a, um, a, uh, <coughs> a, a more effective notion of, um, of a, of a quasi-local quasi -local mass. OK, so those are just some speculations. Again. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm only writing this down because it's the formal analog. Uh, it's not, I wouldn't state it as, as a conjecture without further, further hypotheses, but I think it's an interesting um, uh, question to ask. Um, okay, so, um, so those are just some closing comments about these two notions that I discussed last time. And what I want to do in the rest of the lecture today is to describe, um, describe how the these ideas generalize to higher dimensions, okay? And so, actually, in, in mathematics, of course, studying geometry in, in all dimensions is important, but, but higher dimensional gravity is also studied a lot by physicists. So, so there, there, there are various motivations for uh, considering higher dimensional gravity. And in particular, it's, it's, it's the, the idea of defining quasi-local masses is, uh, is uh, again, a, a, I think a useful, a useful notion. So um, let me put one thing to rest, and, and that is that, <clears throat> um, so I now want to consider, so I have the brown York mass here. <clears throat> so, so if I now consider, instead of uh, M3, I consider uh, a manifold Mn, G, and again with scalar curvature non-negative, then um, the, the brown york mass is not going to be a good notion at all because <clears throat> because you almost never have isometric embedding so ev even if even if the boundary geometry is just a perturbation of the sphere of course the standard sphere embeds but but even if you perturb it 
just generically by a little bit, uh, you won't be able to embed it in, uh, in uh, isometrically in Rn plus one. So, so, so it's almost never true. Is sigma <clears throat> isometrically embedded into uh, Rn? as a hypersurface. And so, so actually, if you could embed it, I mentioned the proof of positivity, which uh, is done by Xi and Tam. That proof actually does work in higher dimensions as well. It's just that the applicability is, is extremely limited. So, so the problem is that, that the, uh, the isometric embedding problem uh, as a hypersurface in, in dimension bigger than two, that is when the, the surface has dimension bigger than two, is an overdetermined problem. So, so um, it's a problem. So, so a metric, a Riemannian metric on, on sigma has, <clears throat> you know, components locally g, i, j. So <clears throat> i and j run from 1 to n minus 1. Uh, and um, the question of, of isometrically embedding is the problem of finding a phi. So we want to find phi, which is <clears throat> phi 1 up to phi n. So I, I would have n embedding functions. And the equations which make it isometric are that, are that <coughs> gij is equal to the partial of phi with respect to xi, dot product with the partial of phi with respect to xj. This, this would be true for all i and j. And so um, in particular, the number of equations is, <coughs> is, uh, is the, the, number of, uh, the number of functions in the metric, and that's uh, and that would be uh, n minus 1 times n <coughs> over 2. This is, uh, this is um, the number of equations. But the number of unknowns is only n. And so I'm look I would be looking for n functions for which these, these, these very large number of equations is satisfied. Well, you can see that when n is 3, then uh, this is 2 over 2, so this is 3 and this is 3. But if n is, b if n is 4 or higher, then there are many more equations than there, are, than there are unknowns. And so even a small perturbation will, <coughs> you, you could take a, the standard sphere and just perturb it randomly and you won't be able to find a solution. Okay, so, so, um, so you do not expect to be able to do that. And so the whole idea you know, pretty much falls flat. I mean, it's, only would be for extremely special domains that you could uh, actually define it. And so, and so the Brown-York mass doesn't generalize very well to higher dimensions. However, um, um, the other two notions, that is the, um, the um, asymptotically flat case, uh, and the, uh, <clears throat> the polyhedral cases actually do generalize. And so, and so I want to say, describe how that works a little bit today. So it um, involves some interesting geometry. Um, so, um, so let me first talk about the, um, so the, the claim is if I take n greater than or equal to 4, there are extensions of the, uh, first of all, the asymptotically flat case. That would be the positive mass theorem. Uh, <clears throat> and the other one would be the polyhedral case, which is I called case 3 before. So they both do have successful generalizations. Actually, the polyhedral case, the work, the, the complete work is very recent, and it hasn't, um, in, in, in higher dimensions, it's not yet fully worked out for the tetrahedral case. So the, but the cubical case actually appears in a, it was just posted to the archive a week ago, I think. It's a, a paper of, um, uh, of Chao Li in, the, in that case. So, so, um, so let me start again, because, because actually the, the cubical case, again, as in the three-dimensional case, is very closely related to uh, the ideas that I described for proving the, um, the, uh, the positive mass theorem. So let's, let's first look at the positive mass theorem. In, in, uh, so let's suppose we have mn g <clears throat> with scalar curvature greater than or equal to zero, and suppose it's asymptotically flat. And again, I'm going to assume special asymptotics like I did before. Again, it can be, it can be justified. <clears throat> you can take any arbitrary asymptotics and just perturb a little bit 
keeping the mass essentially the same and, and, have, and demand these asymptotics. So, so I'm going to assume that G near infinity, so remember M minus K is diffeomorphic to Rn minus a ball. And we can choose coordinates x1 up to xn. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to demand that the metric near infinity be uh, u to the a conformal factor, and it's convenient to write it in this form, times delta, the Euclidean metric. This is on m minus some large compact set. So, so I'll assume, again, that the metric near infinity is, um, is conformally flat. And then, and then the same set of ideas we, we talked about in the three-dimensional case, so it, it works similarly. So, so again, um, uh, the proof is by contradiction, actually just as it was for, uh, for the uh, polyhedral case as well. Uh, so, uh, so we assume, so let's assume that M is negative. And so um, U here is um, a harmonic function outside a compact set. And so, so U of X has an expansion. It's 1 plus M over 2 mod X to the N minus 2. So now the Green's function for the Laplacian on Rn is <clears throat> 1 over R to the N minus 2, and then plus terms that vanish more, more quickly. So this is as X is large. <clears throat> so, and so the mass, the definition of the mass, we can just take to be that that number that occurs in the, in the expansion. And so, and so in particular, if M is negative, that gives us very specific uh, restrictions on the geometry near infinity. And in particular, the one we're interested in uh, is the statement that if we take a, a large slab, so we, take, we could do any coordinate, but let's say we take Xn equals lambda, so lambda is quite large. So we're out in the asymptotic region. And then we take <coughs> Xn equals minus lambda down here, and, the, and, and the, again, the same calculation we, we did before shows that the, this slab is mean convex, so the mean curvature vector points in, both on the top and the bottom. So this slab is mean convex, and in particular, it allows me to construct uh, minimal surfaces, area minimizing surfaces, which lie in the slab, so I can take a big circle out here, and construct them, and I, I can do what I did before. And now there is an issue, of course, in, the, in this. Uh, I'm, only, I'm always going to work in cases where the surfaces are, are smooth in this talk. So, so, <clears throat> so I assume also that n is less than or equal to 7. Because again, there's this weird phenomenon, this weird thing that happens for volume minimization. If you're, if you're in very high dimensions, 8 or higher, you can have singularities for these surfaces. So, so, uh, so let's assume, let's not deal with that issue here. It's, it's, uh, it, it would add too much complication. So let's just assume that our um, <clears throat> hypersurfaces are regular. Uh, and, then, and then we could go, we could let the circle tend to infinity and we produce asymptotically planar. So there exists asymptotically flat uh, area minimizing <clears throat> or stable in particular we're interested in sigma. Okay, and so, so that's what we did in in, in three dimensions. And then in three dimensions, we were able to just use the stability inequality to say that that's not possible. So we used the Gauss-Bonnet theorem, stability inequality plus the Gauss-Bonnet theorem on, the, on sigma, which is then a two-dimensional surface, uh, and then we ruled it out. Now, it, it's a bit different in higher dimensions. So, so, um, so the, the important remark is that it's not enough to just find uh, asymptotically, so th this is, this, turns out to be not, not sufficient. So, so um, we have to figure out some way to, well, to replace that Gauss-Bonnet argument. And so, and so um, uh, actually, for n greater than or equal to 4, there are lots of asymptotically flat area minimizing surfaces. In fact, if you take any plane, so there exists a sigma asymptotic to any plane. any point at infinity. So, so you don't need the barriers at all. So this is true, this is true whether or not the mass is negative. So, so there's a difference between the, four dimension, the three dimensional case and the, and the four dimensional case, the four and higher dimensional case. And so that may be not obvious, but let me, let me explain that. So, so in other words, it's not sufficient just to have one uh, uh, area minimizing hypersurface. And so, um, um, so you can ask, well, what part of the argument doesn't work? Well, um, in, in that argument, we, we 
we used the fact that the, the, uh, the plane was two-dimensional because we, we, we wanted to take our variation to be one. I'll write this down again, but, but that argument that we used to, to cut off a constant variation doesn't work in, in the higher dimensional case because the, uh, the, the volume growth is too large. It doesn't, you can't do that. And, and in fact, um, uh, there, there are a ton of these. In fact, you can understand this quite easily because uh, there's a nice uh, analog. So, the, so minimal surfaces which are close to planes, minimal hypersurfaces, uh, are, are, behave like graphs of harmonic functions. So, so if I, if I take a, so I have this hypersurface, it may be quite complicated inside, but near infinity, near infinity, this is, this is the graph of a function. So this is like xn equals uh, u of x. And then the condition that the graph, that the surface be minimal is essentially the Laplace equation near infinity. So when it's very flat, it, um, the function's basically harmonic. So um, you can understand this, this phenomenon in, uh, in, in a sort of linear model. So, so there's a, <clears throat> just to understand this, so there's a model problem which is <clears throat> quite simple. <clears throat> so suppose I wanted to solve on Rn Laplacian u equals f, where f has compact support. And suppose I want u to be asymptotic to a constant, c, where c is given. Question is, can I do that? So, so that's sort of what I'm trying to do, right? I'm trying to say that for any plane, I can construct this minimal surface. Well, it's not really a, the graph of a harmonic function, but near infinity, it, it, it's pretty close to that. So, so, um, so the question is, when can you do that? Well, the answer is, so, so it looks a little like Newtonian gravity, right? If, if this were a, uh, a um, gravitational, if this were a mass distribution, then, then you know that you can solve this in R3 and, uh, and you get the, you get the Newtonian potential. Okay? And so, in fact, this is, the answer here is yes, for n greater than or equal to three. I, I, let me call it rk because k is actually n minus one. <clears throat> uh, it's true, for, yes, for k greater than or equal to three, but no for k equals two. And so it, it's related to the fact that the, the Green's function of the, of the Laplace operator on R2 has a is a logarithm. And so it's not bounded near infinity. And so, um, and so it's, a very similar, um, uh, it's a very similar phenomenon. So, so you can sort of force these solutions to approach a constant, uh, a given constant over any plane uh, in, if you're in higher dimensions, in, in, uh, if, if n is, is at least... Um, at least four, um, and you can ask. Well, so there's a. You can ask. Well, what would happen in two dimensions if you tried to construct a solution like this? Well, you could take a big disk here, and you could solve Laplacian u equals f here, and say u equals zero or u equals c on the boundary, and then you could let the radius of the disk go to infinity. Well, what would happen? What would happen is that the the, the function f would go either to plus infinity or minus infinity. It, it won't converge. So if this is sigma, you get a solution u sigma, then uh, the limit of u sigma does not exist. And exactly the same thing happens in the three-dimensional case when you do, when you look at these minimal surfaces. So when you solve the minimal surface, if you don't have the negative mass condition, you don't have the barriers, the, the, the mean convex region, what will happen, so if you did this in Schwarzschild or something, what would happen with positive mass, what would happen is these minimizing surfaces would just drift away. They would, on compact sets, they would go, to, go uh, either to infinity in, on one side or the other, depending on how you chose your boundary data. Okay, and so uh, that's a good linear analog. And, and it, it turns out, of course, the minimal surface problem is nonlinear, so it's a little bit different, but, but, uh, <clears throat> but it turns out that, that there's no difficulty. There, there are lots and lots of complete asymptotically planar uh, area minimizing surfaces. And so, um, <clears throat> and so uh, what, what do we do about that? Well, <clears throat> so um, the idea, the proof is that um, it's not enough just to have one of these things. You, you, have, to, you have to have uh, a very special one, and I'll, I'll, call it, I'll call it strongly stable. And so it actually 
is re somewhat related to this free boundary uh, condition that we imposed in the cubicle case. And so uh, let me be a little brief about it because I want to, um, I want to uh, spend some time talking about the finite version, the, the cubicle case. So the basic, the basic issue uh, the, the basic issue is that um, what I can do, so I have the, let me just draw a picture, so I have the, I have the upper plane, the, uh, this, the upper slab xn equals lambda, and I have the lower slab, minus lambda, and then I can look at the cylinder, so I can solve for a large radius here, and I can take these circles on this cylinder, and for each of those, I can, I can minimize area. So I get this, this minimizing surface here. And they'll all, they'll all lie in uh, between minus lambda and lambda because of the, uh, the mean convexity of the slab. Um, but what happens is the mean convexity, so then what I have to think of doing is sliding up and down. So, so I can ask, well, what's the best height for which I can take here? And it turns out the best height it is not lambda or minus lambda. And so the, the mean convexity condition together with, of course, the, <coughs> the angle condition guarantees that there's some special choice here. So there exists some height here. Let's call it, say, um, so this will depend on the radius sigma. So let's call it h sigma. Uh, so that this surface is smallest. So the, the measure of, so we, when we go up to height h, uh, is greater than or equal to the measure of the special one. So this is the, be the best one. And these h sigmas are strictly in the interior of this, uh, this interval, minus lambda lambda. And that's, again, because of the geometry of the situation. So in other words, not only do I construct a surface, I construct the best one. I allow the boundary to slide up and down. And, um, uh, and, and then I produce the sigma, and then I can go, to, then I can go let uh, sigma go to infinity, and I produce this special surface, which I'll call strongly stable. So I produce a limiting surface, sigma, which I'm going to call strongly stable. And so what's important about it, <clears throat> um, so uh, a, uh, a minimal hypersurface being stable means if I do a compactly supported variation, the area goes up to second order. Uh, strongly stable, I'm going to define to be the condition that <clears throat> I'm allowed to choose variations which are translations near infinity. So I can allow variations. So the second variation, del squared sigma, is positive for all variations phi. So uh, again, as usual, I take sigma and I take the normal. And then the variations are defined by functions. So, so if I take phi to be compactly supported, then stability means that the second variation is non-negative for compactly supported variation. We wrote that down as a, it's an eigenvalue condition uh, on, the, <clears throat> on a, a linear operator on sigma, the Jacobi operator. Uh, and so the, the requirement here is that I can allow not only for phi of compact support, but I can, I can require phi to be in C infinity compactly supported sigma, or I can allow phi minus 1 to be uh, C infinity compact support of sigma. In other words, I, I can allow phi to be a constant. So I have this, it's because I built in this extra, this extra translation that I can do. And the, the surface actually minimizes not only for compactly supported variations, which fix the boundary, but also ones which move the boundary uh, in a parallel manner. Okay? And so that's the, this is the original, the way we did the positive mass theorem in, um, in, in higher dimensions. And, and in particular, what happens is that, um, um, what happens then is, um, and I'll explain this in a little more detail in a minute, but what happens is that um, on this sigma, so this sigma has an induced metric, let me call it G1, um, <clears throat> it's just the metric induced from M, uh, the stability condition, this condition, uh, actually just with compactly supported variations, guarantees that I can choose a conformal factor to make the scalar curvature of the metric zero. So the first point is this condition implies there exists a U1 so that <clears throat> U1 to the four over, well, N minus one minus two or N minus three times G1 is scalar flat. So let me call this metric say G1 hat. And so the scalar curvature of G1 hat 
is identically zero. So that's, a, uh, that's solving a, it, it uses the eigenvalue condition that comes from the stability, and you only need compactly supported variations to do that. So, so this u1 tends to one at infinity, And so, in particular, this metric G1 hat is, again, asymptotically flat. So, so on, this, on this hypersurface, I get a metric with zero scalar curvature, which is, again, asymptotically flat. Uh, and the, the, what I want to say is that if I started with negative mass on the original uh, manifold, then this will also have negative mass. And that's where the variation comes in. So the, the key step is that um, <clears throat> if I take <clears throat> mg and if I assume negative mass to begin with, that implies that sigma with uh, metric g1 hat has, we call it m hat, <clears throat> uh, negative. And so, and so it's an inductive argument. So if I start with negative mass, I can produce this, this strongly stable hypers. It's a very special one. And it, it again has... Um, uh, a metric with zero scalar curvature and negative mass. And then I can slice down to three dimensions. So that, that's how the argument goes. And let me just explain this, um, this uh, m hat being negative. So, so the, um, <clears throat> the point is that this function u1, so the stability inequality, um, um, del squared sigma being um, greater than or equal to zero, uh, implies um, <clears throat> It, it, it implies that um, it implies that the um, the integral of the norm of gradient u squared on sigma, oh, sorry, phi squared uh, plus the special constant c of n minus one times the scalar curvature um, uh, r one r of g one uh, times phi squared. Uh, is um, is uh, greater than zero if, if phi is non-zero, say. So it's strictly uh, it's strictly positive. So the the r one is the scalar curvature of the metric, and this constant c of n minus one is the conformal the constant in the conformal Laplacian. So generally, c of k is uh, k minus two over four times k minus one. And then the operator associated with that is, the, is called the conformal Laplacian. So it's a little bit of conformal geometry which is used in this. Uh, and, um, uh, and then, um, uh, so this is positive for any uh, provided phi is non-zero. So what, what I want to do, so th this, this function u1 is a solution of this, this operator. So this is the same, the, the, the corresponding operator so it satisfies Laplacian u1 on sigma minus c of n minus 1. Uh, R1, U1 is identically zero. And so what I want to do is I want to replace phi by U1. So I want to look at, so U1 is, is asymptotic to one at infinity. Well, it's not quite equal to one, but it's close enough that you can use it as a variation. So, so what I want to do is I want to replace this by U1, by U1, that's U1 squared. Uh, then um, then I, I get that this is positive. So everything here is integrable. And so what that tells me is <clears throat> that I, so I can write this as the limit as sigma tends to infinity of the integral over a sphere of radius sigma of the norm of the gradient of u1 squared uh, plus c n minus 1 r1 u1 squared. <clears throat> so I get that is uh, greater than zero, right? So that, that limit. On the other hand, um, uh, this can be written as a boundary integral. So if I integrate by parts, I get, uh, I can, uh, I, I get, um, here I get uh, minus u1 Laplacian u1, and here I get, uh, I have C, cn minus 1 r1 u1. So using the equation, I get, I can write that as a boundary term. So it's just like for a harmonic function, the Dirichlet integral gives you a boundary integral. And that's true here too. This is a solution of the corresponding operator. So what this is, sorry, this is b sigma a ball, and this is the integral on the boundary, a sphere. And so what I get is u1 du1 dr integrated d with respect to the area measure, call it mu. Okay, and so what I get is that that limit 
is positive. On, on the other hand, U1 is asymptotic to 1, so it will have the expansion. So U1 of x will look like 1 plus um, <clears throat> uh, M1, so M hat, actually, the, the, uh, the hat mass over uh, 2 times mod x to the n minus 3, I guess, and then plus lower order terms, 2 minus n. So it will have a nice expansion with the m hat appearing there. And you can see by the same calculation that I think Piot did in the first lecture, th this limit, so when I differentiate this, uh, u1 is approaching 1, so I can forget it in the limit. Uh, du1 dr is just a minus a constant, uh, uh, a constant times m hat. And so what happens is that as sigma goes to infinity, uh, this left-hand side just converges to minus some constant times m hat. And so in particular, in particular, that shows that m hat is strictly negative. And so, and so um, you get, so that's how the, how the, the proof goes. So there's, a, there's a, this additional step, which is somewhat close to the, um, to the um, uh, you know, what we, what we did in the cubicle case, right? So in the cubicle case, we, we solved this free boundary problem. Okay, and so, um, so let me, um, So let me claim that there's, um, again, a, a localization of this theorem. Um, so, uh, and, and the, the localization I'll talk about, again, is, is the case of, the, um, the case of a, uh, a cubical um, polyhedron. And so um, <clears throat> the proof is somewhat similar to last time, but, but again, um, the gauss bonnet theorem has to be replaced by... Um, by uh, a different method, and in particular, it's a, uh, a somewhat interesting uh, uh, conformal argument. So, so we used, so just to summarize the steps here, of course, I haven't done everything in detail, but, <clears throat> um, but the idea in the, in the asymptotically flat case is, is we started with, um, with a, um, uh, an asymptotically flat manifold with negative mass, then uh, we produced this special strongly stable uh, area minimizing hypersurface asymptotically planar, uh, and we then used a conformal deformation and the strong stability to show that that inherits the same structure we started with. So that that is, it becomes a a zero scalar curvature, non-negative scalar curvature metric with negative mass. So so we had negative mass and originally, we get negative mass for the slice also, and so it's the same strategy that's used in the in the in the cubical case in higher dimensions. But the conformal argument is a little, uh, is somewhat more, more involved than the one here. It uses, a, uh, I think, a rather interesting um, uh, conformal geometry problem for manifolds with boundary. And so I'll try to explain if, if I don't run out of time. But um, so now, um, so the claim is, so the theorem is that uh, now if I take um, <coughs> omega, now, a, a finite domain uh, in my manifold, or really it's just a, a manifold with boundary, and if I assume the boundary of omega, which I'll call again sigma, for lack of imagination, sigma equals boundary of omega <clears throat> is cubical. So that means that, that, means that it's made up of, <clears throat> of um, um, a certain number of faces would be two to the n faces, which are hypersurfaces, and then they meet transversely at, at the um, uh, <clears throat> along the edges. So there's the so the cube, the, the n-dimensional cube is somewhat more complicated than the three-dimensional cube, right? Three-dimensional cube just had the the interior, the faces, the edges, and the vertices. The n-dimensional cube has has the interior, the faces the co-dimension two edges, co-dimension three edges on down to vertices. So, so it's a more complicated singular structure that occurs here. And in particular, um, the, the, uh, analyzing the behavior of the minimizing surfaces is somewhat harder in this case. And so, uh, and so I, but I'm, of course, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to give the, the, the formal argument. So we assume that this is cubical. Of course, we always assume that scalar curvature is non-negative. 
And then again, for an n-dimensional cube, we can define the dihedral angles to be the angles at the, at the co-dimension one edges. So, so the, um, the, we look at the edges, so it's an n-dimensional cube, so they would be the n minus two-dimensional edges. So those are the, where, where two faces come together. And those are the dihedral angles. Uh, and uh, the theorem is, again, that, um, that the, well, we assume that, and we assume, of course, h is greater than or equal to zero. On, uh, on the faces. Uh, then the theorem is that the maximum taken over points in E n minus two, so that, that would be the, sorry, uh, n, yeah, n minus two of the dihedral angle theta of P uh, is bigger than or equal to pi over two, and equality only if trivial. Meaning that it's the standard, <clears throat> it's the standard cube or standard rectangular solid in, in, um, in, uh, in um, the boundary of the rectangular solid in Rn. Okay, so that that's um, uh, that's the theorem, and and the idea of the proof is very much parallel to this idea, and so uh, let me just say it in words, and then I'll try to fill in at least a few of the. Um, uh, geometric details go into it. So the, the first step, so, so the, the basic idea is, is like what we did here. Uh, so the, again, the proof is by contradiction, um, the same way that um, the positive mass, this, this proof of the positive mass theorem goes. And so, um, <clears throat> so we assume for sake of contradiction that the maximum is strictly smaller. So we start with an n-dimensional um, uh, region whose boundary is cubical. And, um, and then um, what we want to do, so we get this, and then the, the, what we're going to do is we're going to construct a slice. We're going to, again, minimize the area, and we're going to produce an n minus one dimensional uh, uh, region manifold with cubical boundary, which also has uh, Maximum dihedral angle less than pi over two. In fact, in fact, the argument will never increase the, ma the maximum dihedral angle. The dihedral angles will go down in, in the in the construction. So, so um, how do we do it? Well, we do something similar to what we did last time. Namely, we have a little hard to draw an n-dimensional cube, but um, but uh, we have uh, we we choose two opposite faces. So we we have an upper face and a lower face. Um, and because of the angle condition, so, so the, because the angle here is less than uh, pi over two, and because the mean curvature is positive on, on all of the faces, both the top and the bottom in particular, we can, we can argue that there is a area minimizing surface that divides the two faces, and it, and it doesn't touch the top or the bottom. So, it's, uh, so there's a surface here, curved surface, a little is my sigma, and sigma is now n minus one dimensional. It's a, it's a hypersurface. It divides the top, the, the, the bottom from the top face, and it has the property that it minimizes area among all such surfaces that do that, uh, divide the top from the bottom. Uh, and again, the reason that surface exists is because, so you might worry that when you do that, you might just push up and, and touch the top or touch the bottom. And so the reason that doesn't happen is because of the mean convexity inside, so it can't touch inside, uh, and it can't touch at the boundary because of the angle condition. So the picture is like this picture I drew for geodesics last time. <clears throat> because the angle here is strictly smaller than pi over two, I can construct this minimizing uh, curve, and that, that it won't hit the top or the bottom if these are... Uh, I mean, it convex inside and has angles smaller than pi over two. So, so again, in, in n dimensions, we can do that. The only problem, of course, is that uh, we, we always assume that n is at most seven, so that, so that sigma is non-singular. Right? So it's a smooth, smooth hypersurface. And so, um, so we construct this, um, this sigma, and that then what we want to show is that, in fact, sigma is an n minus one dimensional counterexample. So what we want to claim is that 
Okay, so this sigma has a metric. Let me use the same notation. Uh, let me call it G1 so as the, the induced metric. Uh, and the claim is there exists a function U1, again, positive on sigma. And we take G hat 1 is U to the 4 over N minus 3 times G1. Uh, I can choose a metric so that uh, if I take sigma with G1 hat, so that it has zero scalar curvature, R G1 hat, identically zero uh, inside, uh, and the boundary of sigma has zero mean curvature at the smooth points. So, so in other words, we can take our metric, so similar to what we did here, we took the induced metric, we can formally deformed, in this case, keeping it asymptotically flat, uh, in this case, keeping it with the correct boundary condition, that is the mean, the mean curvature being, well, we need it non-negative, so, <clears throat> so it's most convenient to make it zero when we solve this problem, uh, and zero inside, and moreover, the dihedral angles, so because the surface meets the boundary orthogonally, the dihedral angles are the same. So if I, if I take a dihedral angle at a, at a co-dimension two face of sigma, that will be the same as the dihedral angles. That point would be in the co-dimension two face of, of, of um, sorry, sig of, this should be sigma one. Uh, that, the, the, that would be uh, the same as the dihedral angle uh, of sigma, the original <coughs> boundary at the same point. Okay? And, so, and so the claim is the maximum dihedral angle P and E n minus 3, 1, so for this metric 1, is less than or equal to the maximum we started with. And that's assumed to be less than pi over 2. Okay, so we don't increase the dihedral angles because the, the surface is meeting orthogonally, and so the dihedral angle will be the same as, the, as it was originally at that point. Okay, and so, and so how, do we, how do we do that? Well, let me say a little more about the, the conformal part of it, which I think is not, well, maybe many of you haven't studied any conformal geometry, but it, even for people who study conformal geometry, it's not a completely standard uh, uh, construction. In particular, uh, this, um, this function here, uh, U1, this conformal factor, uh, satisfies both um, the right interior condition and the correct boundary condition to uh, make the mean curvature zero. So this would be, this would be H, uh, I should call it H1, the mean, the mean curvature of the metric G1 hat. Okay, and so let me say a little bit about conformal geometry and, and the, what's needed in the, in, in the proof of this. And so I think it's of interest in its, its own right, and, and it just works out perfectly in this, in this case. It's kind of remarkable how the second variation uh, inequality exactly, exactly gives the right constants and, and uh, to make everything work out. And so, and so, um, so let, let, let me say, let me digress a little bit. So that, that's the strategy. We're gonna, we're gonna start with a counterexample in dimension n. We're gonna slice and take it, get a counterexample in dimension n minus one. And then we've already done the three-dimensional case. So, so we'll, um, will uh, <clears throat> go down eventually to three dimensions. So, so let me um, just give a, fill in a little background on, <clears throat> on conformal geometry here, I've got it. Um, so, um, so I wanna look at a uh, situation, so I'm, I'm interested now in a manifold with boundary. And I have a, a metric. Um, then um, I, want to, uh, I want to look at the, 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 the following consideration. Let me call this background metric G naught. I want to consider conformally varying it. So let's say this is K dimensional. Then uh, I want to <coughs> write it as U to the four over K minus two times G naught. And then there's one very standard uh, conformal calculation which, uh, well, which everybody in relativity and geometry should know. I mean, if you, if you know the conformal method for solving the constraint equations, for example, it's used there, there heavily. It's also used in any, almost any um, work in conformal geometry. And that is that the scalar curvature of G, the 
metric G is, um, <clears throat> is given by a very nice formula. It's, there's a constant, which I'll call C of K, the same constant I uh, had earlier, to the minus one, and then there's a power of U, which is minus K plus two over K minus two, and then there's a linear operator, so let's call it L naught uh, of U. And this linear operator L naught of U is the Laplacian uh, with respect to G naught of U, and then minus the same constant C of K times the scalar curvature of G naught times U. So, so L naught is just a linear operator, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's just a linear operator on, um, uh, on, on M, and it's simply the Laplacian plus a, a, um, a, uh, a, uh, a zero order term. The zero order term is the background scalar curvature times a constant. And this constant C of K, which I, the one I used before, is K minus two over four times K minus one. Okay, so that's, a, that's an important calculation in conformal, in conformal geometry. Now the other important calculation is something I alluded to earlier, and let me write it down in this, in this setting. So, so now I have the boundary, so I have M as a manifold with boundary. I have M, boundary M, and, and that is the relation between the mean curvature uh, with respect to G, I'll call that H, and we call H zero, the, this is the mean curvature of the boundary with respect to G naught. So I used this earlier, there's a, also a nice conformal uh, deformation uh, argument for that, so U to the minus two over K minus two. And then, uh, I wrote this down before, it's H zero minus K minus one. And then times the logarithmic derivative is the normal derivative, so I choose, a, I choose the outward normal here. It's the normal derivative of U to the two over K minus two. So I wrote this down with a square divided by U to the two over K minus two. Uh, so, <clears throat> So in this formula, I had written down for, for the metric V squared times G naught. And so my V is <clears throat> U to the two over K minus two. And now this, this is just the logarithmic derivative. So this is equal to uh, two times K minus one over uh, K minus two uh, times D nu of U over U. Okay, and now we're particularly interested in the case when the mean curvature of the new metric is zero. So we want this to be zero. So if we want to choose some other mean curvature, it's a lot more complicated because the, this factor of u plays a role, but it becomes a nonlinear boundary condition. But, but if we want the mean curvature to be zero, then the boundary condition is very simple. So notice, by the way, this constant is related to C of k. It's just uh, one over two times C of K. Two C of K is K minus two over two K minus one, and so that's one over two C of K. And so um, this equation, so, so it, it, if this is zero, then I can forget that part, and it's just a linear boundary condition. So the linear boundary condition is the normal derivative of U um, <clears throat> minus, and I'll multiply through by two C of K, times the background mean curvature H naught, and then times U is zero. Okay. And so, so the condition that I impose zero mean curvature on the boundary is a linear boundary condition. So that's a good boundary condition from, uh, from the point of view of eigenvalue problems, if you like. All right. It's a nice linear boundary condition. Uh, and inside I have a nice uh, linear operator, well, if I want to make RG zero, of course, I make this zero. So RG equals zero is equivalent to saying L naught of U is zero. That's also a linear problem, right? <laughs> because again, <clears throat> this, this term is irrelevant and, uh, and uh, it's just a solution of a linear equation. So zero scalar curvature is a linear condition inside and mean curvature zero is a linear boundary condition. And so, and so I can, I can study this in 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 um, a natural way. So what I can do is I can look at. So if I think of it variationally, I can write 
say, E of phi, which is uh, the integral over m of the norm of the gradient of phi squared. And then I get plus uh, C of k times scalar curvature r naught uh, times phi squared, g mu. And then uh, to get the boundary condition, I subtract 2 times C of k times the integral of boundary of m of h naught times phi squared. So if I <clears throat> look at that quadratic form and I try to diagonalize it, or I look for eigen, eigenfunctions for that, then uh, it has a discrete spectrum. So, the, so if, I, if I look for eigenfunctions, eigenfunctions will satisfy the condition that uh, L of, uh, an eigenfunction will satisfy L of u is minus lambda u inside, and it will satisfy the boundary condition, which comes out, um, just if, if I, if I, um, um, if I uh, just compute the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the deformation, the, the, the variation for the form is exactly this one. It's uh, d nu u to c of k times h naught u is 0. So in other words, if I think of the eigenfunctions as giving me conformal factors, those will automatically make the boundary mean curvature 0. Okay? And, so, and so in particular, you can do the sort of thing you do with closed manifolds. Um, there's a, there's what, what I call a trichotomy theorem. So, so you know, if you take, if you take a, a surface, a two-dimensional surface, which is closed, there are three cases. Uh, there's the case of positive Euler characteristic in which case there's a positively curved metric on the surface. There's the case with zero Euler characteristic, in which case there's a flat metric, and there's the case with negative. So the, the same thing is true here in, in, in for conformal metrics. So, so the claim is, in fact, let me just do part of it since I'm running out of time. Uh, if I look at the lowest eigenvalue, lambda 1, uh, is greater than or equal to zero, if and only if there exists a, uh, a, fa a function u, a positive function, uh, satisfying um, uh, the scalar curvature of u to the uh, 4 over k minus 2, right, um, times g naught is, a, is, um, is uh, greater than or equal to 0 uh, in m, and h, the mean curvature of the boundary of m with respect to this metric, uh, the mean curvature with respect, let's call this g, Hg is identically zero. So, so the positivity of the lowest eigenvalue uh, of this of this uh, quadratic form is exactly the condition that I can conformally deform my, the metric on my manifold so that its its um, its uh, scalar curvature is non-negative inside. So that's because lambda is non-negative. So the eigen if this is positive, then the scalar curvature becomes uh, non-negative or positive, and, um, and zero mean curvature on the boundary. Okay? And, so, and so the way it works, and I, maybe I don't have time to do all of the calculations, but, um, but the beautiful thing is that <clears throat> the stability inequality on sigma, so, so I'm going to apply this on, on my hypersurface sigma 1, this, this general result. So the claim is that, so on sigma 1, stability, which I'll write as del 2 sigma 1 <clears throat> greater than or equal to 0. And that, of course, is for that, that allows variations which move the boundary. So I wrote that down yesterday when I did the uh, three-dimensional case. So maybe I don't have time to write it again. But, but the claim is this, is this non-negative for all variations phi implies that the lambda 1 over here is non-negative. Okay. And so, so remember, in the stability inequality, there's a boundary term that comes in. And there's also a, a, a term involving the scalar curvature inside. So, so it turns out the constant in front of the boundary term and, the, the, and in terms of the scalar curvature work out exactly correctly to reduce to this case. And so, and so notice here the, um, the constant C of k. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the, yeah. so here it is. So, so here I have a C of k. Here I have a 2 C of k. 
Okay? And, so, and so it turns out that those, those constants work out exactly right so that the stability of this sigma 1 implies lambda 1 non-negative, and that's, and that's where the conclusion comes from. There exists uh, the conformal factor u as over there. So in other words, <coughs> this, uh, this conclusion. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so that's the, the argument. So again, the, the argument is then by, by downward induction. So, it's, so you start with an n-dimensional counterexample to the cubical uh, theorem, and then you slice, you produce this n minus one dimensional hypersurface, and because of the because of the variational structure of that, of that uh, n minus one dimensional hypersurface, you end up conformally changing the metric on it to give you an n minus one dimensional counterexample. And then eventually you slice down to three dimensions, and we, <clears throat> which we already handled using. So in, in the three dimensional case, we use the gauss bonnet theorem on the, on the two dimensional slice. Um, okay, so I'm one minute over, so maybe I'll stop here for today, yeah.